Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin. And I'm Martin Mullen. And today we're discussing the future of healthcare. So for those who haven't heard our previous episodes with Martin, Martin is my cousin. He's also a physician and eye surgeon. He's currently doing his residency in ophthalmology at the University of Texas. And he'll be doing his fellowship in ophthalmology at Harvard in the fall, assuming that shelter in place has ended by then. Anyways, Martin, thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having me back on. Happy to be here. Yeah. So first, I'd just like to ask you, because you're the physician in my life, what is it like to work in a hospital during the COVID crisis? How has it changed your normal work day to day? And how would you rate the level of preparedness? Well, um, I mean, I'm in ophthalmology, which is all uh, eye related uh, surgery, you know, eye related care. So a lot of our surgeries are elective, like cataract surgery. So all of those have been postponed. Like mm -hmm. every elective, you know, we're trying to conserve all the PPE. We're trying to use a lot of the um, inpatient uh, surgery rooms for potentially like COVID patients if, if the ICUs get overflowed. So they've canceled all elective surgeries. Most of our clinics have been canceled. So we're only seeing um, eye emergencies right now. So mm. I'm taking call at the Children's Hospital. And so, you know, kids have had not as much COVID. I mean, it is a little bit scary sometimes thinking that a lot of these kids could be asymptomatic carriers. So you just have to kind of assume that mm. anybody could have it and, you know, protect yourself as best as possible when you go in to see a patient. But I'm not in the on the front lines in the same way that like emergency medicine doctors, nurses, uh, ICU doctors, internal medicine. I mean, those doctors are the ones right now that are uh, really doing most of the dangerous, you know, work. And uh, but I know in New York there are they've pulled ophthalmology residents to work, uh, you know, on the floors in the general hospital because there's such a need for more help. Yeah, But at Texas, you know, at this point, I mean, fortunately, it's not nearly as bad as New York or like Chicago or Michigan. And so we don't know if that will ever get to be as bad as they are or if it's only going to be, you know, we're like two weeks behind the curve and two weeks from now we could be in a much worse situation. So we're preparing. But uh, yeah, it's not it's not quite as bad as it is, as it is especially New York. Right. Yeah, I have a another friend who is also an ophthalmologist in Chicago. She just became an official ophthalmologist recently and they pulled her onto the COVID floor. So she's basically been having to help out there just because they've had mm. such massive, um, you know, so many more patients than they're used to that they're really running at full speed. So you guys haven't seen a huge influx yet. You're still not over capacity. We're not over capacity. I work at one of the biggest it's one of the biggest hospitals in the U.S., um, Parkland Hospital. It's a huge county hospital. So they have massive capacity. But then again, we do take care of like, you know, a huge population here. So potentially if there is an uptick uh, in more COVID cases, I think we are pretty well prepared at this point. But, you know, you never know. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it is it is a crazy situation. You know, some of the physicians who have uh, gotten COVID and died actually, you know, have been ophthalmologists. And I think part of the reason is that, uh, if you don't know the person has COVID, a lot of times our exams of examining the eyes require you to be very close to the person, like close to their face with right. them potentially breathing on you. And if you remember that situation of like the first, that one Chinese physician mm -hmm. who tweeted that, you know, this is much worse than the Chinese government is letting on and uh, right, he ended Lee. up dying. Yeah, he ended up dying like two weeks later. He was an ophthalmologist. Oh, wow. And from what I've heard that there are a couple of people in his practice who have uh, contracted COVID and died. So, no, we're, overall, I don't think we're at nearly as high risk uh, of, of getting this as other healthcare providers, but there always still is that chance. So mm -hmm. you have to be careful. And before this whole crisis started, did you have, uh, you know, N95 mask? and eye protection for those sorts of close close encounters or is yeah. that only yeah. and do you have it now or or uh, not yet 
I, I would still say that the, the whole PPE situation has been like such a debacle. Um, wow. You know, like in the beginning, especially they were like, no, you don't really need. I mean, it's the same thing that the public has been hearing, too. Mm -hmm. At first, we don't need masks. Um, and then, you know, because there's a mask shortage, they're kind of telling you, oh, maybe it's better if you just use like a bandana or something at home. But I had to grab an N95 mask myself maybe like three or four weeks ago. And I've had to hang on to that one alone and reuse that one wow. for the last like four weeks um, because they're only really giving those out to people who are going to be treating the COVID patients. Hmm. Like, and do you wear, I, you know, do you wear yeah, eye protection too? Proven. I mean, I, I have not been wearing eye protection recently. Hmm. Yeah, because it's interesting. People always think that, you know, Obviously, it can come through your mouth, and that's probably the biggest concern because you're actively breathing in particles every mm -hmm. moment. But, you know, your eyes are also orifices. And, you know, there was some person who tweeted that I saw where they're like, okay, so you're willing to put on a face mask, but you're not willing to go the level to protect your eyes. Like, that's where you draw the line from protection. Right. And it does seem like it doesn't get as much attention, but... Um, I don't, I've never heard of anyone actually contracting COVID through their eyes. Is that? I mean, I don't think they know. They do know that it can cause a conjunctivitis. So like mm. a red, you know, eye is one of the symptoms. Um, I don't know if you actually get infected primarily through that route. Like mm. if it first comes in through your eyes, but it's, it's theoretically possible. I mean, if it causes a conjunctivitis and then you're rubbing your eyes and then at some point you touch your mouth and then that's how it gets into your respiratory tract mm. or your nose or something. So I don't think it's a bad idea to be protected. I think all people should be protecting their eyes. But uh, yeah, that hasn't been like an official recommendation for ophthalmologists. Right. Unless the patient's known to have COVID, you know. Yeah. And there was something else interesting about what my, my friend Annie was saying about the hospital where she works in Chicago, where she was saying that a lot of people are not getting the procedures they need because they're not doing any elective surgeries. So there may be a situation where it's helpful now to delay elective surgeries, but it may lead to people you know, dying or having complications because so many of the elective surgeries have been put off. So there are health concerns there for the patients. And then for the hospitals themselves, elective surgeries is where most of the profits are generated. So I've, I've you know, I've listened to this episode of The Indicator where they talked about a lot of hospitals are even cutting staff and potentially, you know, having to go bankrupt unless they get support from the federal or state governments because they're not able to make the kind of money that they typically make while they're also at the same time having to invest in all this additional, you know, PPE and ventilators and staffing up. So I'd like to get, you know, your sort of thoughts on, you know, both the health effects of patients delaying their surgeries and the business effects of hospitals needing to fully transition to focus on COVID. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a huge problem for sure. I mean, there are, you know, I think for cases like like cataract surgery where there's not really harm in waiting, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, those are surgeries that can definitely wait a long time. You're not going to, you know, the final outcome is going to be the same, but I worry, and this is in my area of expertise, but I worry more so about people not getting the proper like cancer screenings, mm. you know, that could lead to a diagnostic delay, um, that could lead to a worse outcome. People who aren't getting like certain cancer surgeries. I mean, what you define as, uh, elective can be kind of a gray area too. Like, yes, right. it's not imminently life threatening. We don't have to emergently do the surgery right now, but it probably would be if it were you or me, uh, I'd rather get it done sooner than later, you know, especially if it was like a cancer or something. Right. And there's also the concern of let's say you are a cancer patient and you need to get chemotherapy treatment. But now you have this extra risk of, oh, if I go to the hospital, I'm already immunocompromised. I could potentially be exposed to COVID. It adds another variable where you have to consider the pros and cons of going in for treatment. And mm -hmm. you know, obviously, that's why there's this big push for telehealth and doing whatever you can do remotely, remotely. So I'm also curious about 
if your personal uh, work has at all moved in the direction of telehealth. And I'm also curious of how much of your job could you theoretically do remotely if you had all the tools versus what really has to be done face to face? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, there is, I mean, there's definitely this big push, like you're saying, for telehealth now. Like, can we do a lot of the same visits over, you know, an interaction like this, like a video chat, essentially? Can we accomplish the same thing? Can mm -hmm. I diagnose the same thing? And I think maybe for certain fields, um, it's probably pretty effective. You know, I think there are a lot of unnecessary visits you know, a lot of times maybe you're just going in for an annual checkup and really what you're there for is for like a medication refill mm -hmm. or something. Um, you know, maybe those are better off uh, done over like virtual meetings. Um, maybe like if you have an established like therapist or psychiatrist or something like that, then, you know, maybe those interactions can be equally as effective if done over telehealth. Mm hmm. For ophthalmology, I mean, it's there is a real uh, uh, technologic uh, gap there between like what you can do, you know, the adequate exam uh, that you can do in person versus over like video chat. Like I don't mm -hmm. have any of the same tools, the instruments that I use in the office. I mean, I'm like I can look at you right now and be like, yeah, your eyes look pretty straight. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's not a whole lot I can I can yeah. tell without equipment. So. Until there's like true innovation where I can get the same exam here sitting in my, you know, in my apartment over video chat through, I don't know, through new devices or, uh, or cameras or something, you're not, it's really a subpar uh, mm -hmm. replacement for it. Yeah. I mean, I've even been sort of realizing that my vision isn't as good as it used to be. Like mm -hmm. my brother was making fun of me because I couldn't read what was on the TV the other day. And I was like, damn, like maybe I should get my eyes checked and see if I need glasses. And mm -hmm. I assumed there would be some app I could download that would be a vision test. And there really isn't. I mean, Warby Parker created some app where if you already had a prescription, you can do this test based on the distance from your screen to your face where they show you different things and it'll update your prescription but they don't allow it for people that haven't had a prescription yet because it's not accurate enough. Right. Um, do you think that that's an area where it's possible we just haven't built it yet? Or do you think that you really need to be sitting in a chair, you know, filtering through different types of lenses and seeing with your own eyes what, what looks the best to you? I think that you could theoretically come up with something where it's like the same machine that we use to look at the front part of the eye and mm -hmm. a special camera system. Like both of these things already exist, like a camera system that exists to look at the back part of the eye. But those are super expensive technologies right now. I mean, you have there's no way that you're going to be able to in a cost effective way distribute like that kind of technology to every single mm -hmm. person who just wants an eye exam, at least not now, you know, right. maybe in the future once technology becomes more affordable. But uh, I, I think the more likely situation is you would have like one center, maybe even like in a Walgreens or like mm -hmm. a CVS that has basically purchased that item. And then you go in and you kind of like put your head in this thing and maybe there's an actual person there that can kind of help you position or something like that. Um, and then it can like take a photo or real time stream that image to someone like me who's like sitting and looking at it and has like a joystick or like other things that I can zoom in on different stuff. Right. I mean, that I think is definitely possible. Um, I don't know how fast it can happen, though. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I, I saw this other funny tweet where people someone was like, you know, what would be really useful in the age of covid? is a tiny machine where with just a single drop of blood, you can do testing to find any number of, of results and metrics, which is, you know, he was making fun of Theranos, which is yeah. the whole idea behind Theranos. Right. But it really would be incredible if, like you said, there was at any local Walgreens, you could go there and rather than having to go to a hospital that has lots of, you know, sick people, you could go to whatever the nearest place is to you and then, you know, prick your finger, 
see if your test, you know, see if you test positive for COVID, maybe see if there are other, um, you know, other interesting learnings that your doctor can find from that, those tests. So it does seem to me like that's where this needs to go, sort of becoming more decentralized from the testing side, and then perhaps maybe more decentralized on the treatment side as well. And, you know, with uh, David Sinclair, he paints this vision of where you can basically do testing at your home and then you just upload your results to, say, a computer. And, you know, mm -hmm. like imagine you have just like, you know, an external hard drive. Instead of that, you have like an external testing drive where you mm -hmm. can basically put the little sample in, plug it into your computer, it'll upload the results. You can then discuss the results through FaceTime with your doctor. Um, so, yeah, I you think know. for sure for, uh, you know, visits like that where it's primarily what you're doing is reviewing lab data. Mm -hmm. I think that stuff for sure can be done in that way, you know, potentially. Um, but yeah, you'd have to get, you know, maybe have a virtual visit first with your doctor, them to be like, okay, we're going to order like, you know, a lipid panel, check your blood glucose, a couple other things. Uh, you, I mean, at this point, you'd still probably have to go to some lab to get your blood drawn. I don't think mm -hmm. the technology's there yet to do like home testing. Right. Or drawing your own blood drawing your own a little blood. sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it'll, the lab, like there'll be such innovation in the lab sector that they'll be able to uh, tell a lot more from just a pinprick mm -hmm. kind of sample. But right now, a lot of those tests require more blood. Right. So you like go to some place, get your blood drawn. The results would be uploaded, you know, eventually. And then you'd have a discussion, another virtual discussion about like what the implications are mm -hmm. with your doctor. So I think that is for sure going to happen at some point, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've read uh, that was one of the main issues with Theranos is their whole pitch was just a single drop of blood, you know, in their mm -hmm. marketing. But the reality of these lab tests is that a single drop of blood often isn't enough and to have enough confidence in the results you oftentimes need to run like multiple iterations of the test sure. on the blood to figure that out so I, I also wonder if there may like this may play into a little bit of the inequality where i could imagine for instance you know 20 years from now where every really wealthy powerful person has their own like self-testing mechanism in their home just like how you have a laundry room you could have like a medical room that has mm -hmm. whatever you need there whereas you know people who aren't as fortunate have to go into these centralized centers that maybe they're more at risk maybe it takes longer it's slower um, mm -hmm. and then you know that kind of also plays into something i wanted to ask you about which is the whole medicare for all debate because there's really interesting arguments on both sides and I don't really know where I stand so I'm curious to hear your thoughts and the argument has basically been either we need single payer health care for every American or we need a public option that can compete in the free market so we aren't stuck with some shitty government option and the arguments mm -hmm. are really valid on both sides on the Medicare for all side they say that look, unless you replace the current system with one single payer, then you're still going to have all of this massive waste of these insurance companies basically extracting billions of dollars in profits from a system that really shouldn't be profit driven in the first place. So you could, by having single payer healthcare, you could give coverage to every American. You could seriously lower costs because you're getting rid of all the extra profits the insurance providers take. Um, you know, and you get rid of this messy past patchwork of coverage. So in just like in other countries, you have a certain price for certain procedures. People still get to choose their doctors. So that's one side. The other side of the argument is, look, the government can't do anything right. Like when was the last time you went to the DMV and had a good experience? Trust me, you do not want the government handling all of the healthcare system. So why not instead have a public option where people can choose to go with their current, you know, healthcare provider, or they can go with the government option, and then whichever one is better, will just simply win out. So, and of course, this has been complicated even further by the fact that now so many Americans have lost their job, like almost 20 million Americans have lost their job, 
since the COVID-19 economic crisis began. So employer coverage may not be viable now more so than before. So I'm curious, right. curious where you stand on this and if you, there's a different perspective from a doctor versus a patient. No, I mean, I think you summed it up really well. Um, it's a super complicated issue. I definitely don't have the answer to it. Um, but yeah, I think that is a huge problem, I think, is that your insurance is tied to your job. You know, I think that is not leading to really good health care for people. Uh, it's going to be much worse in this situation now that we might have 30 million people unemployed. There are always these potential gaps in coverage. It doesn't lead to a lot of freedom for people to leave jobs they're unhappy with. I mean, I just don't think that that's a very good system that it's not a true free market. I mean, how many people really have that much choice right. over what job they work? I mean, especially when economic times are tough, you're going to probably just go with the job you can get, if any, and you're going to just be stuck with whatever insurance they provide you. So those are big issues, big problems. Um, I agree with you. There's so much waste. There's so many people profiting off this system and really who ends up suffering in the end are, you know, the patients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, you know, saying Medicare for all, like a single payer system or a public option is actually kind of saying the same thing. Because mm -hmm. if you come up with a system that's really an option for everybody to opt into, that's not that different than it's just almost like a slow transition to a single payer system, essentially, which yeah. I'm not necessarily opposed to. I mean, maybe the best thing for society really is to have some baseline care that if you're a U.S. citizen, just like you have a Social Security number, you're guaranteed this level of care no matter what, like you get fired from your job, um, you know, but they're you know, it's going to be expensive and. People should probably understand there will be some limitations. I mean, right. there will be like, you know, the government will probably be able to tell you, yes, you have to go to these. Just the same way that with like in-network insurance tells you. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're trying to mitigate costs some way. So they're going to tell you, yeah, you have to like, you know, use these generics. Like this is the stuff we're going to cover. But hopefully they would set the bar high enough that it's quality care. Right. You know? So you have, there's like a baseline yeah, care universal basic health care, just like universal yeah. basic income. I, and then if you yeah. want, you know, like from an individual, there is still some free market forces out there, hopefully. Like if you want to have more choice about where you go and what doctors you see and the fact that maybe you can get a second opinion up at Mayo Clinic or you like using brand name drugs for whatever reason, um, you know, you can add supplemental private insurance maybe on top of that or you're just willing to pay out of pocket for certain things. Yeah, I, um, I agree. I, I think that if you made it more like software products where everyone gets the basic plan for free, or but you can also upgrade to the pro plan where you get extra, like right. that seems like a good plan, not only for healthcare, but also for income, where we still have a capitalist system, but we're just raising the floor from zero to some level of, of you know dignified living um, but then I still don't really know where I stand as it relates to whether single payer is better or a public option is better because I could see that if you went with a public option you would still have the whole lobbying force of the insurance providers and potentially like Republicans or some members of the of the political class Mm. trying to take down the public option in the same way that a lot of Republicans wanted Obamacare to fail so badly that even though they couldn't, you know, outright get rid of it because they didn't have the votes, they could make it hell for the ad administrators who are actually running Obamacare by not giving them adequate funding, by making these weird rules. And, and so I could see a similar thing happening where if there's a public option, a lot of people sort of gather together to try to thwart the success of the public option. Um, whereas if we switch fully over to, to single payer, maybe it's like, OK, well, we got to do this well because it's kind of the only thing we have. Um, but I also am not too keen on just you know, putting full faith in the government to figure it out, especially, uh, you know, given how poorly they've they've handled the covid mm -hmm. crisis. Yeah, I mean, that. I mean, like you said, the 
counter argument is like, do you really trust the government to handle everything perfectly efficiently? Um, you know, do you ever want to give power to any one entity like completely? Right. Uh, you know, so I mean, that, that that's a real argument uh, to be made. But I think I mean, let's say you have a public option and it's it's a good option. It's an affordable option. You know, it doesn't have as high of like deductibles or premiums. I mean, most people are just going to do that then, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so then that will be, uh, you know, private insurances won't really be able to compete with that. Mm -hmm. And then it will just essentially, and then you have, eventually you have, you know, probably like 80, 90% of the population on a government program, essentially, whether that's Medicare, Medicaid, the public option, something yeah. like that. So. I mean, then essentially the government does have all the power then because they determine how much hospitals get paid. Um, right. But I, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think that, you know, a lot of these insurance companies are out there offering really like low quality insurance, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other way you could do it is you could just set the bar higher and be like, you have to cover more things. You know, you can't leave people with like massive bills. If you want to exist, you know, we just somehow I mean, there already are those laws. And unfortunately, there are people still taking advantage of the system or, you know, institutions that are still having these unethical billing practices. Right. And there's no way to yeah. really enforce it. I mean, there is yeah. a way, but they're just not there's not enough, uh, you know, people out there who are actually enforcing these laws. Right. You have to be really savvy to navigate it. So the people yeah. who are the most vulnerable are suffer the most. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the role that big tech companies are playing. But before we do that, I just I wanted to get a sense for amongst doctors. Is there a sense for if we move to Medicare for all, it'll be really bad for us? Like we won't be able to really make a living as much as we used to, because um, I've, I've, I've seen a little bit of that concern online um, versus like is there any benefit to doctors in working in that kind of framework? Like, I really want to see what does it look like from a doctor's perspective? You know, you've, you've spent years and years studying, paying all this money for tuition. You've really honed your craft. You've competed with so many other people to get to where you are. How do you think about, you know, a doctor earning a living and how that might be impacted by switching to Medicare for all? I mean, I think the concern is that if you look at from a doctor's perspective, uh, you know, if I'm being completely honest, is if you look at any of the other single payer systems, I mean, doctors in other countries definitely get paid a lot less, like mm -hmm. significantly less. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you look at a system like the UK or Canada, a lot of times medical school is paid for for those mm. doctors. And so they're not coming out with like massive amounts of debt that they need to pay off. Um, so if there was, I think if they, you were to go to a system, you have to come to some, uh, you know, reasonable regulation in terms of, uh, like how much you can charge for med school tuition, or maybe med school could be completely covered by the government. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it definitely is a concern that, you know, doctors, you know, essentially you'll give all the reimbursement power to one entity, the government, and then there's no bargaining power on, uh, either end. There's no competitive market. So then essentially the government can just decide to pay you whatever they want to pay you. Right. Which is fine if they pay you something fair and reasonable, but you have, you know, you have no say if they just decide like essentially that a surgery is going to cost a certain amount um, and we're only going to pay you a certain amount. And that's, it might actually be tough for some people who have like massive amounts of student debt who are, you know, taking that on expecting to earn a certain income. Right. And, um, and why is it that elective surgeries are such big profit drivers? Like, why do doctors make so much with, say, a knee replacement, whereas they wouldn't make much at all from, you know, testing and treating a COVID patient? Um, I think I don't really know 100 percent like exactly why that is, but I think that primarily it's because overall it's a much lower overhead, you know, like the patient is in and out of there in like a day surgery center. You're not admitting them to the hospital, using up a ton of resources there. Hmm. Uh, a lot of times there is like a device that you're implanting. So there's like some kind of profit to be made, like whether that's a, a lens in the eye or a new knee or something like that. So there's like higher profit margins with 
uh, you know, putting in different devices. Mm -hmm. And it's just like a more efficient, you know, you can bill for procedures and you can do, you could do multiple procedures in a day, you know, versus maybe somebody who's managing an ICU unit or something. They're just taking, they're not doing that many procedures, but they're taking care of a lot of complex patients there. Right. So I think that's why, you know, a lot of times the surgical subspecialties make a lot more money for hospital systems. Hmm. And so, like you said, I mean, if a lot of these are elective surgeries right now that are being postponed, uh, you know, a lot of hospitals are losing a ton of money right now because yeah. of that. Wow. And private practices and, you know, other things too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm also interested in how this whole space may change as the big tech companies become more involved. So, you know, Amazon is one major entity where they're, they've been working on this healthcare of their own called Amazon cares, where first they're going to provide healthcare for all of their employees. And then the idea is that eventually they have their own healthcare option that you can get through Amazon, which mm. is kind of awesome. Um, so I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. And then, some other big type companies that are becoming involved are Apple and Google. And specifically with them, something really exciting is that they have partnered together for, I think the first time in history to create an app for contact tracing with COVID-19. Have, have yeah. you heard about, heard about that yet? It just came out um, a couple a days ago. Bit, a little bit. Yeah. So basically the, the way this would work is that, there's an app on every iPhone and every Android phone that uses Bluetooth to identify if you've come into contact with someone else who tested positive for coronavirus. So this would, the mission of this, the reason this is important is that it would allow us to start to reopen the economy and have some confidence that we'll be able to track if there are additional new outbreaks and be able to quarantine the people who have come into contact with those positive cases. So basically, mm. once you test positive for coronavirus, you note that in the app, and then any person whose Bluetooth signal comes near you would then be notified, hey, you were just right next to someone who tested positive. And this would basically allow them to create a map of all positive uh, tests of people who have posited, uh, tested positively and all the people they've come in contact with, which would just give tremendous visibility into this. And it would allow us to create, you know, green zones that are more or less safe, especially if a lot of those people used to have it and now they're resistant, uh, mm -hmm. you know, red zones where a lot of people that, that are not resistant or they just, they, or they've tested positive. So I'm curious just how you, see the the role of big tech in healthcare and if you view it as a positive thing and an exciting thing or if you um you know view it as something that you know potentially threatens the system or would replace the system or i don't know just any, I mean, any what are your thoughts yeah. on like i guess the first thing that comes to my mind is all the privacy issues with right being willing to like give up all that data that's i mean on one concern. hand i want to be like okay fine this is probably better for society but then in the short term, but you know, you never know what they're going to do with that in the long term. Right. Well, apparently they use a unique identifier code that's randomly generated at different times. So you wouldn't be able to track back like to the individual level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any third party wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that, but that's just, you know, from what I've read from journalists, like who knows if there's some loophole where people would be able to track and this you could always, somebody could hack it. And... Yeah. So it, it is a concern. And, and then, by the way, this plays into something else where it's interesting to think that there are clinical clinical trials, which is typically how we determine, OK, is hydrochloroform safe or not? Let's do a clinical trial randomized and see what the results are. There's this other type of analysis, which is using real world data. So for instance, recently researchers have wanted to know what are the effects of coronavirus on people who have cancer? Is it a lot worse than people who don't have cancer? Are certain types of cancers, do they put you more at risk if you get coronavirus than other types mm -hmm. of cancer? And there's just not that many people 
uh, you know, it'd be hard to run a clinical trial with people who have cancer, who have coronavirus, who then get tested with hydrochloroform and see how that impacts the results. So it's hard to run a clinical trial like that. But what you could do is you could just collect data of every person with, with cancer who got coronavirus and just see what their results were. And this sure. is, this has not been as possible in the past because we just weren't simply able to aggregate data from lots of people unless they were in some controlled setting like a clinical trial. But this is becoming more and more possible where you can essentially just query the whole population of people who have gotten whatever disease and see what their results are, especially if you know other information about their health. So it seems like there's this whole world of possibilities for delivering better, more targeted healthcare and learning how diseases uh, impact various people if we're able to get beyond the privacy concerns. But of course, the privacy concerns are there for a reason. You know, we don't want to have a situation like in China where there's bio tracking and certain groups like, you know, Muslim Uyghurs. Are and then it's linked to a social and, credit system or something like that. Or yeah, like even in, insurers could take advantage of that information and charge you, you know, higher premiums because they tracked that you went to McDonald's last week. And right, right. You know, but it's, it's an interesting trade off. I don't know if you have if you come down on one side or the other. Well, yeah, I think that a lot of I mean, there's a lot of good research that potentially could be done if there was a better data set. You know, if there was just a massive data set of like all this information that we've been collecting in the electronic medical record system was just like de-identified and available, like open source for anyone to run, you know, AI tests against, pick up patterns, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of potential to, you know, uh, find certain things and and make interesting discoveries on that i mean the gold standard for all, all these tests is always you know a random uh, like a double blinded placebo controlled mm -hmm. uh you know randomized trial right um uh but so yeah but yeah there are probably a lot you know it's kind of like these electronic medical record systems like um, like Epic is the one that a lot of companies mm -hmm. or that a lot of hospitals use. Um, it's even hard sometimes to get information from another hospital that has Epic, you know, just on right. the simple purposes of just looking at a patient's history, not even to run any kind of study. You know, right. Just to be like, oh, wait, why can't we easily access their record from this other, you know, hospital that they were seen at that might be in a different city or different state? It's still Epic, but there's still like barriers to that and it's a really inefficient system yeah and just imagine if you had access to all the data that apple has about a person you can literally know how much they sit on their couch versus how much they move around how many mm -hmm. steps they take what their heart rate is um, you know there's so much extra data you can or for instance amazon you can see what types of food and groceries they're buying uh, you know, how many sugary drinks and other things they're buying. So when you have all the data of these big tech companies, it just seems like it unlocks this whole world of possibilities that maybe if you're some smaller, you know, medical software startup like Epic, you just aren't going to ever be able to tap into that level of, of knowledge. Right. But it would require some kind of cooperation because they themselves possess a lot of the medical data. You know, so it would be require some kind of maybe maybe relationship between Google or Amazon and the current medical record system. Right. Yeah. OK, great. So there's one other topic I'm really interested in. I know it's not your specialty, but you are knowledgeable about a lot of things related to science and medicine. And that's with the genetic aspect of all this. So sequencing has gotten a lot more affordable. So in 2003, it cost a billion dollars to sequence someone's genome, whereas now it costs about $600. And there have been some interesting developments where, you know, for instance, it's quite possible there are genetic components related to COVID that we would like to find out. So it might be useful if we had people's genome sequenced and, you know, we could then sort of deliver either precision medicine or tell people how at risk they are based on their, their genome. 
none of that's really been done because people haven't uh, sequenced their genomes on a widespread basis. And other, you know, interesting things related to geno uh, sequencing genomes is that in the last year, there was the first ever gene edited baby in China, which mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about in the past. And there is now a Russian scientist who has five other parents who are going to have gene edited babies. And this author of this book, Hacking Darwin, which talks a lot about this stuff, he estimates that there will be a thousand gene edited babies a year later. So basically we go mm -hmm. from one to five to a thousand. And at that point, the genie's out of the bottle. And it may be, you know, on the one hand, it's scary. It's like, do we really want to go the path of like designer babies? And it gets a little bit dystopic. But on the other on the other side, we may need to, in a certain regard, when you think about how people there's pollution is getting a lot greater. It's now clear for COVID that, resistance. Yeah, COVID resistance. <laughs> but yeah. you know, I mean, now whenever there's some major crisis that needs to be handled, a lot of our what was previously taboo now becomes less taboo because there's a major problem that needs to be solved. Sure. So just first at a high level, uh, I'm just curious if you're if you think this is like a promising area that should be explored versus a dangerous area that we should perhaps like think twice or three times before we explore it. I mean, my opinion is that it's a promising area that should be explored. I mean, I think it'll start out the way that most technologies start out. It'll be for people who have really horrible genetic diseases um, that are life threatening or, you know, significantly alter the quality of your life. And maybe that's in your genes and you have a high chance of passing that along to your kids. And with like a simple, you know, gene editing technique, you could edit that gene out of there, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe things like, you know, cystic fibrosis or hemophilia, um, a lot, lot of different genes that are like single gene mutations right. that are that you would inherit from your mother or father. Um, I mean, maybe those diseases will be cured from this. You know, maybe yeah. we'll, we'll see a worldwide, uh, almost like eradication of those diseases due to gene editing. But yeah, of course, then always the concern is there, are there people pushing the boundaries? Are you starting to edit for like, you know, height, you know, eye color, athleticism, even if they were able to find a bunch of genes that were linked to IQ, you know, then you essentially are creating like a dystopian future where the people who have the money to spend on doing that will mm -hmm. create like a Gattaca like situation right. where you're actually discriminated against, you know, unless you've had some of those. And I don't think the most from what I've read, and I, I really don't know much about this at all. It's not my area of expertise, but I think the more likely situation is that there is a way to just basically take a ton of um, you know, a bunch of like fertilized embryos, like the same way that you would do in, uh, or take a look at for in vitro fertilization Yeah. and basically be able to sample the DNA and select, you know, before you implant it, um, uh, you basically find the ones that might have high risk gene mutations or certain diseases and you don't implant those ones. Yeah. That's so I think I like traditionally having that. children, will like be a thing of the past like right. almost like everybody who has the means or maybe it will be covered by future insurance i don't know but it'll probably become much more commonplace to you know have some kind of like in vitro fertilization and a selection of uh you know s to rule out certain diseases of certain embryos totally yeah mm -hmm. yeah i mean just to to give one example to sort of bring this to light right now if you get in vitro fertilization they'll create like 10 or 15 embryos and then they'll test them. And for instance, if you have a genetic disease, like, like, uh, was it Tay-Sachs? Yeah. Um, you're pretty much going to die if you're a baby and you have that disease. Yeah. So th I think there was data that nine out of 10 parents, if they find out their baby is going to have that, even if it wasn't through IVF, they just find out through, you know, prenatal testing that, the baby is going to have that they abort that child before it's come to term because they know it's going to die anyways so you could avoid all of that pain and suffering by simply testing the different embryos 
and selecting one that doesn't have that uh, genetic condition. So that seems like a scenario where, okay, clearly this is just doing good. It's not doing anything uh, bad. And right. it also might be safer from the sense that, you know, we used to think that, oh, there's a tall gene and a smart gene and a blue eyed gene and whatever. Now our understanding is that all of your genes sort of work together to create different traits. So it's not always as simple as switching a flipping a switch because when you flip one switch, it might have different effects elsewhere. So maybe it's safer to just let nature create the different iterations. And then we just choose amongst them from, you know, let's say 10,000 embryo, which is now becoming possible. It doesn't have to be just between 10. You can literally select the fittest offspring of 10,000 iterations, which is kind of incredible. And when you think about just doing that for a few generations, of people, how much that could change society and our ability to tackle these major challenges. Um, it's pretty incredible. So I, I guess like how, what, what would you predict? Like how prevalent do you think this will be this, uh, you know, selecting of embryos, you know, let's say like, you know, five, 10 years from now. I mean, I think five, 10 years from now, it'll mostly be done for those kind of like, you know, genetic diseases or uh, inherited genetic diseases that uh, we were talking about before, you know, mm -hmm. hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, maybe some things like metabolic diseases like Tay-Sachs and stuff like that. But I think it will be commonplace. Yeah. And I think that maybe initially some people will just have to pay out of pocket, but it seems like it'll eventually become an ethical situation that the government should Right. Once for, I mean, is... Even if you take the humanitarian side out of it, you could even make an economic argument that like somebody who has this disease is going to cost the healthcare system a lot more than if you just cure it before it ever even happens. Right. And so like if you have people who are talking about, oh, it's not cost effective. I mean, you could even make that argument. Yeah. Or if, if China already pays for it for all their citizens, then. The U.S. may need to pay for it for China. our citizens, yeah. so we're not at a disadvantage. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, but I don't know. I don't know. what. I mean, all these gene problems are essentially big data problems. Like you said, right. you know, those are the simple ones that we know that one, one gene leads to or a mutation in one gene or one point in that gene leads to a certain disease. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other diseases or traits or whatever, where it can be hundreds or thousands of genes. We don't exactly understand how they all interact, how changing one could affect the final outcome. Right. Like, like for instance, with the, the first gene edited baby in China, that baby is more resistant to HIV now, but less resistant to West Nile virus and may have less longevity as a result of that gene change, just based on what we know. So there's so many second and third order effects. So I'd, I'd like to now, I want to get into the future scenarios, but first I have a few rapid fire questions that I'd just like okay. to get your <laughs> quick takes on. Okay. Okay. So first rapid fire question, when do you predict the lockdown will begin to be lifted in the U.S.? Beginning of May, end of May, June, July, beyond that? I'm going to say end of May. End of May. Okay, nice. Yeah. Okay, now prediction on whether there will be a second or even third wave of infection after the lockdown is lifted, end of May. Uh, I predict there will be other, whether you call them waves or not, like other outbreaks mm -hmm. of uh, corona, maybe like clusters of them essentially in different cities, different areas, another nursing home. We think we're kind of through it in August and then September rolls around and there's a nursing home in this area that everybody gets Corona. And that I think is going to be the reality until there's a vaccine. Right. I don't know if there'll, uh, there'll be another like massive shutdown uh, and another huge wave of people the same way there is now. But so that coronavirus my... will be around until there's a vaccine or like an antiviral that comes out. So that was going to be my next question is, do you think the second wave will be bigger or smaller than the first wave? And for context, in the Spanish flu, the first wave was relatively small. Second wave was way bigger 
and third wave was bigger than the first, but not as big as the second. What How far you... were they spaced out? Uh, man, I don't have the picture in front of me. Because if it was like, if the third wave was more than a year and a half away, then I'm confident we'll have some kind of vaccine. Okay, I have it here, actually. Yeah. All right. See if you can see this. Yeah, I can. So the second wave is like... So it was spaced out like basically from... Five months. Well, the whole the whole three waves is basically spaced out over almost a year. Okay. So over almost a year, you have three waves. First wave is smallest. Second wave is biggest. Third wave is second biggest. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't know a lot about virology. So it's hard for me to predict. But it seems like nobody really knows. <laughs> so, so you think the fir- um, probably the first wave is the biggest? That seems like I hope so. Maybe I'm just trying to be optimistic about it. Right. But, okay. Yeah, I mean, I have I have no reason to believe otherwise, but I don't know. It's possible. Sure. Okay. Next question: Prediction on whether there will be single payer health care before the next election, 2024. I do not think that there will be single single payer house health care before the next election. No. What about uh, public option by 2024? Uh, no, I mean, it, I guess there might be some expansion of like Obamacare. I just can't see this administration going to yeah. passing any kind of like dramatic health reform in terms of insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, so not in the sense that I think you're thinking of it in, but they might expand like medicaid or medicare or obamacare or something like that but i don't think they'll create a whole new system of like a public option right okay Uh, prediction on whether gene well maybe not gene editing is not the right word but whether selecting certain embryos based on their genetic traits will be commonplace by 2030 i think it will be commonplace yes okay Prediction on whether longevity for Americans will increase or decrease by 2030. And keep in mind, longevity has been increasing for pretty much all of like modern history up until recently. And in the last few years, longevity has gone down. So I'm curious if you think that we will begin to live longer again or if the trend the recent trend of longevity going down will continue um i think a a lot of it rests on well one do we solve this corona issue you know quickly is this whole thing kind of a wake-up call for a lot of americans who are maybe previously living an unhealthy lifestyle and you know obviously the people at highest risk for getting COVID and dying or people who have had like diabetes, uh, heart disease. I mean, some issues that are no through no fault of their own in terms Mm -hmm. of other preexisting conditions that people have no control over, but for at least the, the aspects of people's health that they can control through lifestyle changes, maybe this will scare some people into changing their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not that confident that it'll affect it to agree that it'll alter the overall life expectancy of the entire country on average. Right. So it might like yeah. flatten a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't see it going precipitously down for any reason other than if we don't solve the COVID issue. Mm-hmm. But unless there's some other kind of innovation in terms of therapeutics for you know cancer or something else that i can't really anticipate i don't see it changing dramatically in the next 10 years totally Mm -hmm. okay last rapid fire question this one's about the economy do you predict that the economic recovery will be v-shaped u-shaped or l-shaped and this is basically asking how optimistic are you about the time frame of our recovery you know v-shaped recovery is there's a major crash and then we come right back and mm. you know we've kind of seen that with the stock market but it's unclear whether that will play out with the rest of the economy whereas u-shaped is slower but you know it takes one to two quarters not going to be anything too crazy whereas l-shaped will be a seriously long recovery like four quarters or more so you know not going to be until 2021 or 2022 where 
the economy is really back and roaring. Uh, which one of those do you think is most most closely match our future recovery? Oh, I don't know. Based on my extensive uh, econ background, of <laughs> taking econ 101 in college like 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've listened to a lot of people who have, who I trust their advice, who think that, uh, there's going to be a huge boom from the stimulus package, like Mm -hmm. without a doubt, but that might not happen until 2021 or 2022. So we might have like a, uh, at least maybe like six months to a year of a bad economy. Whether that's like, I don't know if it'll continuously getting worse in terms of like the stock market, but right. uh, you might have a period of high unemployment um, and uh, that might go on for like a year. Yeah. You know. OK, I have one more rapid fire I just thought of that I should ask. Do you think we will have a vaccine within a year or will it take more than a year? Um. I mean, most people have been saying it'll take a year to a year and a half. And I don't really understand in terms of vaccine development why. I mean, I understand that there's a lot of trial, error, uh, you know, studies that have to be run. Even once you find a successful vaccine, you have to produce it on a mass scale and distribute it. So, like, even if we found an effective one tomorrow, it would take months to really get out there into the market and to get everybody vaccinated. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm hopeful that maybe they can find something and we can get a vaccine in a year. Yeah. It still sounds like a really long ways away. I mean, a year of still having this kind of situation. I don't know. Yeah. And then you always wonder, I mean, my big concern is, you know, they've been saying that COVID has like a similar mutation rate, um, or coronavirus has a similar mutation rate to the flu. And if that's the case, like, who's to say that we come out with a vaccine that's pretty effective, but it's like the flu vaccine. I mean, yeah, and it's like the flu vaccine is like 60 to 80 percent effective any given year. And some years when we try to anticipate what the new mutation is for flu season, we go for like the three strains we think are going to be most likely. And sometimes it's only 40 percent effective. So it's like better that we have the flu vaccine than not. But it doesn't eradicate the flu. And yeah. maybe we're going into a world where even once we get a COVID vaccine, there's enough mutations that we go through COVID season every year and everybody gets vaccinated. But there still are inevitably some people who get it and die from it, unfortunately. But maybe it will be kind of like the flu at that point. Well, let's take a quick break now and then let's get into the future scenarios. Okay, Martin, what is the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Um, So we do not come up with an antiviral in a timely fashion or vaccine. Um, It's more than a year and a half out. Maybe the first one that comes out fails. You know, so we're kind of in this situation where you're still living with COVID with no good treatment or vaccine for over a year, year and a half. And so we live in a society where there is Corona season, uh, even once we do get a good one. Um, All this hype over the innovation in Silicon Valley and the private sector leads to a lot of, you know, seemingly cool inventions, but they don't dramatically change health outcomes of people. You know, and it actually increases the cost of healthcare even more so because hmm. there's selling, marketing these devices, new things that don't aren't actually all that helpful. Um, then you have a, a shift in telehealth like we were talking about, but maybe prematurely before a lot of the technology has been there to to be able to do an adequate assessment of the patient virtually. So, you know you're kind of diminishing uh, the, the quality of that, of that evaluation from the doctor. Mm-hmm. And um, also maybe that virtual relationship like somehow diminishes the, the patient-doctor relationship, something that you couldn't really mm-hmm. get in person that you might have 
I don't know, some could develop some kind of more personal relationship with your doctor is now the doctor is more of like a technician that's just evaluating the data and virtually, you know, giving you their assessment. And there's not a real connection there. Um, there's no change in hospitals or big pharma to, to rein in any of these like crazy costs after this, they continue on to charge exorbitant rates. Um, and maybe the FDA continues to remain this sort of like slow bureaucratic governmental body that, you know, can't recognize what good ideas are coming out of Silicon Valley, the biotech sphere and, you know, fast track them to approval, like the things that actually can, uh, you know, lead to innovation and, and more effective healthcare. And so those things kind of get tied up in red tape and the FDA approval process and all of that. Um, and then we don't adequately prepare for the next pandemic. Right. <laughs> and, uh, basically this whole situation happens again without us learning our lesson about how to prepare. Mm -hmm. And next time it's like, Ebola level death rates right and and that level of contagion that truly collapses society yeah that's mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. well it's not great but it's a nice analysis <laughs> that's yeah. the worst case scenario yeah yeah the one thing I would add to that is that I think the biggest the worst thing that could happen with healthcare is a systems collapse where the healthcare system just gets too stressed and I think the way that a systems collapse could happen, although I'm not saying it's likely, is with just all of the spending that the government is doing, if that eventually leads to an unsustainable level where the dollar becomes devalued and just the whole system, like it's already seems like a fairly fragile system of how doctors get paid, healthcare providers get paid, how patients how much patients need to pay. It seems so fragile that if it the system broke, then obviously a lot of people would go without health care, wouldn't get the treatment they need. A lot of people require, you know, ongoing medical care just to stay alive. So yeah. and you know I mean, at that point it would essentially take the government the government would just have a full takeover of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean before they would allow it to completely collapse, I think they would they would basically create some kind of right. single payer system and just be like, look, you have there'll be government run hospitals or something, you know? Yeah, that's a good I point. I don't think yeah. they would allow, you know, they would allow the whole system to implode. You know, yeah. there's, I mean, it would lead to anarchy. Yeah, totally. I mean, it worries me. I saw this tweet from Ray Dalio a couple of days ago where he said that what's happening right now with our financial system has never happened in our lifetime, but it's happened many other times throughout history. And it doesn't end well. And it's basically this notion of just, oh, spend whatever you need. Money doesn't really matter. It's just yeah. about, you know, and it's, it's perhaps too early to worry about it on an existential level, like America existing or healthcare system existing. But it is really worrisome from a directional level. Like, where does this lead? If the government keeps buying all of this bad debt that is going to go bad and be worth nothing eventually, then we're basically creating a time bomb for ourselves and all the systems that the government that are you know depend on the government and uh, to run or just on the dollar to run could potentially. I mean, be they at have risk. to generate money somehow. You know, right. it's like they can borrow it, they can print it, or they can get it from taxes. I mean, those are the only three ways the government can get money. And if the economy's collapsed, you know, we just, they can't even raise the money to pay for the health care. You know, they're going to continue to borrow from China. If they continue to print, then it's, you know, you run the risk of hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, eventually they have to come to a, a decision of like, okay, how long is long enough that we've quarantined, you know? Can we definitively say the curbs flattened? Can we reopen things without putting undue burden on the healthcare system? But, you know, unfortunately, there will be a real because they're going to have to make that decision before there's a vaccine. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a really tough decision to say, OK, we want to get the economy back up and running. We obviously don't want people to die, but we can't just let the whole system collapse either and have like insane unemployment. Right. Yeah. And then I guess the the other 
worst case would be if healthcare does continue to get better and better for the people at the top, but mm. the level of care that everyone else gets gets worse and worse. Mm. Um, anyways, let's move on to greener pastures and talk about <laughs> the best case scenario. Best case scenario. Okay. So my best case scenario is we come up with an effective antiviral or vaccine pretty soon, you know, within six months to a year. Um, there's a boom of innovation in the science and tech world, you know, spurred by the stimulus bill and just like a general sense of people just being more interested in doing research in uh, healthcare mm -hmm. uh, and medicine. And it leads to a like real development, real technology that actually changes health outcomes for people, you know, leads to better quality of life, healthier life, longer life um, in a more efficient, affordable way. And then you get a shift from manufacturing a lot of our essential medications, PPE, a lot of this stuff that was done in China, we now recognize, you know, for the sake of our own country, if there's ever another pandemic, we need to stockpile this stuff. We need to have you know, manufacturing in like in the U.S. where we can ramp it up if we do come to another situation where we need to, you know, essentially shut down the economy. We can at least be independent from from trade from other countries mm -hmm. um, for like essential materials and medications. Um, we have telehealth implementation now that actually leads to equally effective patient care and it doesn't replace the in-person visits that would actually lead to better health care, you know, only for the ones where it's equal or maybe even better in, in the virtual sense. Mm -hmm. um, you get demand from the government for, for hospitals and maybe certain governing bodies to sort of rein in some of these like ridiculous spending patterns, billing, unethical billing practices by pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, um, we demand more transparency for patients to know, you know, what you're going to pay when you go in. It just seems like there should be some kind of app or something that can look at your insurance, look at the visit you're about to go in, get an estimate of how much you're going to pay before. So you don't get mm -hmm. stuck with some unreasonable yeah. bill. And then there's a fast way for you to argue that or report it to some medical board. If you think that, that it's an unethical billing practice and they're trying to take advantage of you. And yeah, it can be solved like quickly that. before it gets sent to some like debt collector and you get tied up in some legal battle. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, transparency is is, I think, going to be huge. And uh, you want more free market. You want to give the power to the individual. Um, then maybe a, a more simplified insurance system where mm -hmm. we have some baseline for everybody, regardless of your employment status. Um, you know, as long as you're a citizen in the U.S., you get some baseline health care. And then people can buy supplemental insurance on top of that for different things. Yeah. Um, and then we're just much better prepared for the next pandemic that might happen. Right. We can, basically, we have AI systems that can identify, oh, there's an outbreak of something that seems suspicious in this country. It could be a new virus. We do gene sequencing. We have an AI system read that, which can feed out a bunch of you know, potential vaccines. So boom, like immediately we start manufacturing and testing these vaccines on animals or whatever. Um, we ramp up PPE production, you know, whatever it is. And if we have to shut down borders temporarily or isolate before the outbreak happens, then we're able to do that and mitigate it. Yeah. Yeah. Like we can switch into quarantine mode right away. Yeah. That would be awesome. I also wonder, I mean, it would be fantastic if we were able to develop a general purpose antiviral, just like how we have general purpose antibiotic. So I don't know how feasible that is from a scientific perspective, but obviously that would be tremendous for society if we could develop that. And, and maybe it well, needs I mean, there's to be no, I mean, there are based. like common antibiotics out there, but there's no, I mean, each antibiotic is still effective <laughs> against certain types of bacteria. You right. know, so there's no such thing as just like one general antibiotic that can that can kill all bacteria. Um, aside from maybe like, I guess, if you're thinking nothing that you would take as a medication, you know, if you're thinking about like, you know, bleach or something that can like kill all living things on a surface <laughs> and find 
fine. But yeah, every there's still targeted approaches to try to treat the the bacteria that you have and to give you the right appropriate antibiotic for that. And in the same way, that'll probably be true for antivirals. I mean, there's so much variability between different viruses out there. Mm-hmm. I mean, an antiviral that will work on, you know, specifically work on like HIV or something is not going to necessarily work on, uh, you know, another virus. Right. So. Yeah. And then that, that's a good point. And then the other thing I would add to your best case is that being able to query the general population on any axes of health metrics compared with exposure, compared with whatever else, that would just be incredible because we'd be able to go so far beyond what we have now with clinical trials and peer reviewed studies. And I've, I mean, I talked about this a lot with Kip when we did the Future of Knowledge, where the peer review process is just too slow when you're dealing with a real world crisis that's growing and expanding and and evolving in real time. And a lot of the real world discussions about data and possible treatments and testing is happening on Twitter, you know, more so than any, any, you know, the traditional academic routes. So I I could imagine a, a scenario where any independent researchers could basically just query like, anonymized encrypted data from you know provided by apple and google or amazon where you could then just find really interesting correlations you'd be way uh, more knowledgeable about which types of people are most at risk which mitigation factors are work for people versus are risky to other people and it would just give us a much greater level of precision and if you combine that like massive real world data sets with people knowing about their own specific genetic predispositions, like if everyone's able to sequence their own genome and we're not, we don't have major privacy issues, then Mm. that seems to me like that would just be a, a a whole new era of, of a healthcare that we wouldn't, that wasn't possible in the past. So I'm, I'm hopeful that that becomes more possible as companies like Apple and Google work together. Yeah, a lot of that is also, I think, limited just by how good the devices are. I mean, I mean, right now it's like the data that you're talking about is probably all based on like your Apple Watch, maybe your Bluetooth or GPS tracker on your phone that can determine how many steps and maybe like the places that you go. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other metrics that like are probably not included in that and that, you know, might be like certain blood tests that we do or like lab imaging right. things that can only be done in the hospital. But still, I mean, you should, like I said, like if you just made all that data available to anybody to run any kind of AI system on uh, do data analysis, maybe they can pick up on useful patterns out there yeah. that could influence at least maybe the way that we would run clinical trials or peer reviewed trials. You know, it could give us insight into like what should we be focusing on and. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of potential there, and I don't think we're using it uh, properly. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing I was going to say was, yeah, the look at how like the FDA approval process, like you're saying, it takes a really long time, and and for good reason. I mean, we don't want to get things out there that could potentially be harmful mm-hmm. to patients, especially when it comes to new medications or devices or something like that, uh, which does happen sometimes. But on the other hand it is so slow that it's not the same as just like, Oh, I invented this new app. I can get it out like within the next couple of weeks, there is that real, uh, you know, process that kind of slows down innovation in the health sector because of regulatory, Mm -hmm. which like I said, it's not always unwarranted. Right. The doctors, uh, you know, first do no harm is what the doctor's first, you know, mission is. So, and so like for like, you know, any potential COVID treatments right now, they probably are trying to fast track them as much as possible. But think of all the other, I mean, you might have some other disease that's less recognized out there. And, uh, you know, coronavirus is what's getting all the press now. But maybe there are potential treatments in the works that for a variety of reasons are just like, you know, slowed down by the bureaucratic process of approval. And if it's some, if that's you and your health, I mean, you know, you would like that to be fast track too. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you what the best case scenario is for me as a patient. I would love to be able to do pretty much every test I need to at home. 
I know it's not possible yet, but I'd love to just be able to have like a machine in the corner of my house where I do all the tests I need. I upload that. And then not only can I have my doctor look at it, but maybe I can have a whole forum of doctors look at my results and discuss them. And then you could sort of get like a statistical, you know, confidence interval of how likely it is that I have something. And, yeah. and then I video chat with a doctor who I know and trust, and maybe they can even come to my house uh, to do a house visit. Uh, like that would be for me, like what would be optimal for me. Obviously it needs to op be optimal also for the doctors and you know whoever pays for it. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of players. But I, I guess from your doctor perspective, what would be your optimal like 10 years from now, you're a doctor, what does your daily routine look like? How does it how is it different than it is already? Well, I mean, I still don't see us replacing, you know, surgeons in in terms of like real interactions. I mean, I think like robotics and everything are way far off from being mm -hmm. able to replace surgeons and people actually doing procedures themselves. So you'll still have to go into the hospital to do procedures, to do surgeries. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe the vast majority of like outpatient clinic visits can be done remotely. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is an ideal situation for most doctors because a lot of doctors went into medicine in order to have those, you know, face to face interactions with patients. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my concern is that it will turn doctors into more like technicians, like everybody will be more or less like a radiologist. Mm -hmm. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. I mean, some people like that, but for right. some people, they, they hate that. So it's like, are you going into an office setting, like a building for doctors where you go in and like plug into a computer, basically like review a bunch of these people's labs, and then you Skype in and have some conversation with them in like a very impersonal way. Um, Plus there's like that, there's just that element of the, this isn't my ideal. This is just, I'm just right. this ideas out there that this definitely could happen. No, but it's interesting because there's, you know, there's obviously the science of science, but there's also mm -hmm. the art of science mm -hmm. where when you're standing next to someone face to face, you maybe you just gather a little bit more information than you would if you were via Skype, like maybe even in an, an imperceptible sense, you have certain smells you get a certain vibe from them. Maybe you're making correlations between other patients in the past that you've seen and the certain feeling you're getting from this patient that maybe you would lose if you if you just did it over Skype. So and maybe for most things it doesn't like you lose 10 percent of that or something, you uh -huh. know, and maybe for most things it doesn't matter. And the trade off of you actually saving time, money, whatever, you know, just to get it done more efficiently is worth it. But then mm -hmm. there are probably times if it's like, you know, you're talking to them about doing some kind of major surgery. It seems like it would be nice to be able to just do that in person, you know, right. and like really meet your surgeon. So I think maybe like pre-op exams where you like meet your surgeon or something before you do something. I mean, I still think those like will be those. done yeah. in person. Mm -hmm. And I think that people will still have in-person visits to maybe like establish care uh, you know, with a doctor and then it's kind of up to them if they want to come in, you know, mm -hmm. to be seen or if they could do it virtually. I don't know. You kind of leave the freedom up to the doctor and the patient. Yeah. All right. Well, let's bring it home for the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. I think we reopen the economy it's like a slow phase um, where we're kind of like, okay, if we come out with an antibody test or a way to prove that you've had COVID and recovered, you can go back to normal life. And then we try to ramp up the testing so that almost everybody can get tested at any time, especially healthcare workers. You know, that way we can really isolate only the populations that definitely have it and sort of self quarantine those people and the people that they've come in contact with rather than shutting everything down. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of getting back to normal really does rely on the testing ability. Yeah. Because until we get to a vaccine, that's kind of the situation we're going to have to live in. Whereas some people are inevitably going to have it. Some people are going to be asymptomatic carriers. If they're asymptomatic, you just have to test everyone, mm -hmm. you know, like commonly. And it might be something that you have a card like, 
I'm immune. Like I've proven that I've like had COVID and if there are going to be any kind of mass gatherings, like a football game or whatever, you'll have to literally show that like your ID to get in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully there can also be like tests that can give you an answer very quickly, like within minutes. Yeah. So you're not going and spreading it to other people while you wait for your results. And then if we have those technologies, I think we can mostly get back to pretty normal. You know, mm-hmm. it can be pretty normal. I mean, it'll still be really scary for the higher risk people and people who aren't immune to it until there's a vaccine. Yeah. So I think in terms of post COVID life, that's kind of how things are going to be. But yeah. I think eventually the economy will pick up. Uh, if anything, there will probably be a boom because of the stimulus package. But that might not be for another year. Mm-hmm. Great. Now, I guess just final question. Do you have any advice for listeners about how they can stay safe or what they should be doing right now to protect themselves and their health? I think it's, if you have the ability to go get tested and you have any symptoms whatsoever, I really think you should. I mean, I understand that there are limitations and some, some hospitals don't have the ability to test everyone. They're only testing people who they say, well, it's going to, you know, we're going to admit you to the hospital. You're really sick. Those are the only tests we can give out. But my understanding is that now most states have ramped it up to the point where if you have significant symptoms, you can get tested pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a friend who they're only, they were not a healthcare worker. They've been self-isolating like as everybody else has been doing this whole time in Chicago. This is Mikey's fiance. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. And essentially had complete their only symptom was like complete loss of the sense of smell and taste Uh, wow like was just eating dinner last weekend and like couldn't taste anything and then like even tried to just smell different things like nail polish remover and it was that profound a loss of sense of smell they couldn't smell something that strong but had no (laughs) fever no cough uh felt pretty good overall and was actually thinking about, well, I've, you know, I've been self-isolating like the last month. I'm thinking about maybe going to see my parents sometime in the next like two weeks. That's so went ahead and got it. Exactly. <laughs> so went ahead and got tested, came back positive. Wow. So I think it just goes to show that you like two things. One is that maybe the media, it, it is definitely very scary. It's real. I mean, obviously people are dying from this, but there probably are a lot of people out there who have very low grade or no symptoms, which is both good and scary because Mm -hmm. on one hand, most people are going to be okay. On the other hand, they could easily spread it to higher risk populations. Mm -hmm. So just be really careful. I think until the testing ramps up or you've definitively gotten a test that says, no, you don't have it. I would be really careful about going to visit like your parents or anybody who might be immunocompromised, the elderly, I would really just stay away from them. Yeah. And wear masks whenever possible. And wear masks when possible, wash your hands, all the stuff you've heard before. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Martin, for taking the time. It's been a good conversation. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. And thank you to all of our listeners. This has been the future of healthcare. What is currently happening? And we'll see you next time. What will inevitably happen? The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future, baby.